Samantha. Hello. That's your name. And I know that right now because we just met and it says it right there under your face. That is my name. That is me. I am very excited that you're here. <laughs> Um, as I always try to give people context, uh, whether or not we know each other, I've had some new friends on, I've had some old friends on recently. Uh, you and I don't know each other at all, at though. All. It sounds like from my notes here, 17, I graduated in 13. It's very likely we were at least on campus at the same time, but I certainly yeah. have no idea who you are. Do you know who I am? No, no. You may know my sister. My sister graduated, um, two years before me, she, but she was in production design, Haley, Richardson. So there's a world, maybe she worked on a film of yours. It, that, it rings a bell. It yeah. absolutely rings a bell. Um, but for in that context, then we really, we don't know each other at all. So this will be we fun. Yeah. <laughs> um, you were asking me a question right before we started that I thought was really interesting and I would love to answer it for everybody. So do you mind asking it again? Yeah, I, I'm just curious. Um, because as much as we don't know each other, I also haven't really listened to the podcast. I've seen the clips and I'm curious, what is it when you're going into each of these? Like, what are you hoping to find uh, most often? I will start by pointing everybody, uh, including you, if you're interested sincerely, towards uh, an episode that I published in the fall after doing this for about 10 years, uh, or I guess nine years it would have been at that time. Um kind of going into it and there's an episode uh i don't know let's say it's seven or eight uh, episodes back maybe more called uh why is that the elephants or why and what is that the elephants or something like that um and it's basically just me there's no guest on it and i'm talking about the evolution of how things have changed um and why that answer is long um mm -hmm. so i'm going to give you a short version of it and tell everybody the long versions over in that 30 minute rant Perfect. um so the short version of it is that it has changed uh, tremendously. Um, when I first started doing the show, I literally was just talking to my friends about things I thought my other friends who also knew them would listen to. Mm -hmm. I just wanted, I was like, I just thought, I don't know. These are the people I can get who are like my own classmates. We all just graduated 20 minutes ago. A bunch of them changed their name for like, show business and uh for different reasons so that was the first episode it was like mm -hmm. i just tried to get themes together and stuff these days it really has moved to trying to understand two things what kind of people show up at this school mm -hmm. where are they from is a lot of what i consider to be the answer to kinds of people I'm not necessarily talking about demographics. I'm not necessarily talking about um, identity as much as I'm talking about specific stories, individual, unique. What, who are each of these people? Yeah, what um, film? Yeah, and and I want to make that distinction as opposed to trying to like I'm not over here with a a, a pie chart of these people and those people. I don't really right. think of it like, that wow, way. Wow, a lot of people from Omaha, Nebraska, coming to UNCSA. No. <laughs> not at all. And I don't want to say that that there's not conclusions drawn, but they they really honestly are not really based on identity or uh, any kind of demographic or anything. Um, so with that being said, that's the first part. And then the second part is, uh, and I choose these words kind of carefully, despite uh, how people might feel about them. I'm interested in how you cope with uh, the education of that institution. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> and I don't mean that to paint it negatively. Mm -mm. I want to make sure I'm not painting it negatively. But I, mm -hmm. I say cope in that whether your, for example, your family provides a really healthy, happy upbringing, you have to cope with that. Because sometimes mm -hmm. there's things that make life more difficult or interesting because that happened to you. And of yeah. course, if you have terrible traumatic things happen to you, you have to cope with that as well. So I use that word cope, not to give it a negative connotation, but to say there is a wide spectrum. I found out being in Winston and going to that school. And then of course, doing this show for another decade, there's a wide spectrum of uh, feelings about that education that range all the way from it's the greatest thing that ever happened to me. It saved my life to uh, it. It might have ended my life. It was one of the worst things that's ever happened to me. And I, I can't believe I let myself go there. And it is all the way in between. Oh, yeah. I, I'm in the first boat. 
but it doesn't keep me from being interested objectively in the whole spectrum. Yeah. Yeah, totally. So I don't, I hate to roadmap your episode before we even get started. <laughs> I don't know that I've ever done that for anyone. Well, I think it's fair to say but as that an experiment, people, let's see what happens. Yeah. I think that most people are probably coming on here. If you went to UNCSA, there's something about story that you find fascinating. So it's good to know, like, okay, you know, we're, we're all, I mean, we're all the main characters. So I'm so interested in to see how this goes, but yeah, good to know. Well, let's make it easy and start where I always do, which is Samantha Richardson, my new dear, dear friend. Where close. are you from? We're so close. <laughs> yeah, we go way back, all the way, all the way back. Like, where I'm are you from? Dear? Um, I well, it already gets complicated. I, let's go. <laughs> I grew up. In Lay the- it out. Don't skip yeah. shit because I'll I'll yeah. ask. Yeah, I'm a military brat. So got it. Yeah, not only a military brat, um, but the child of um, divorcees, um, my parents got divorced when I was like six months. So my entire life has just been like bopping around from place to place, home to home in some regard. But most of my family is in Washington state. So I usually say Washington state is home. And that is where I graduated from high school at the end of all the bumping around, um, which led me to UNCSA. Wonderful Um, summation. Can I break it down a little bit in the parts that might be interesting to me without trying to bore everyone with the whole family tree that we might be cracking open here? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) Um, So do you have siblings that you share with these two parents that birthed you? Yeah. So my older sister, Haley, who she also went to UNCSA for uh, makeup and design, um, her and I are biologically of the same parents. Okay. And I have a younger half sibling, uh, which of, side from my biological mom and my stepdad. Okay. And I also have an older stepbrother, um, that is the child of my stepmom who is married. to Okay. Me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So when your parents got together and they had your sister, mm-hmm. that was the beginning of this family from like kind of from your perspective. It's not like they both had a bunch of marriages before they got together. Yeah. They were each other's first let's start a family. Yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. And all right. yeah, yeah, interestingly enough, like I mean, I'm sure everyone can say that, you know, we all have ancestral trauma, but I sure. there's so much so many layers to my family just going back to my grandparents that I don't even want to know what my ancestors did wrong. I don't even want to know. It's we've got enough to to work with just one generation back. I think um, yeah. I relate to that more than we have time for me to explain to you. Perfect. That'll um, be a different podcast for sure. Absolutely. Um, um yeah. okay. So then let's let me shift a little bit then because it sounds like everything everything shuffled up real quick. How long were your folks together before your sister was born? Um, I think they were together for like two or three years. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. the whole marriage is only like three or four years long. Basically, yeah. My mom um uh left her parents' house when she was 16 and lived with her grandmother, because again, those those layers of of stuff. Yes. Um, and she met my dad, who uh was a drug dealer. Okay. And- Specifically marijuana. So we don't have sure. to talk about that. <laughs> no, let's not trip. I've sold a lot of marijuana. It's been a long time, but <laughs> yeah. I've sold you went to a lot and of it. Everyone had their stint, I'm sure. At we some all point. We all make money some, some, somehow. Um, Goddamn right. And uh, so they met when my mom was like 16, 17. And, and she got married to my dad. Like, yeah, I think when she was 18 or 19. And had my sister at 20 she has the sister yeah 21 and then at 23 has me yeah okay and then at 23 and a half she's done with your dad yeah, yeah exactly and do they immediately get into new relationships or is there a big gap there's like a, a two or three year gap but they both got remarried the same year when i was uh when i was like kind of clean for the storytelling Oh, it works great. And my yeah. mom and my stepman stepdad's story, um, they got married after only knowing each other for three months. Cool. And yeah, yeah. They met on New Year's Eve 
my, I, it was another, my mom was moving out of an apartment, two little girls in her hands, trying to move, moving back in with her dad to, cause she couldn't, she was a single mom. Um, and my aunt had a boyfriend who was in the military and she asked her boyfriend to get a bunch of his friends together to help my mom move. And my stepdad was the only one who showed up. And, uh, it was like new year's Eve that day or something. And he asked my mom to go out and she was like, no, I can't. And then he teased her. They went out, had their first kiss, fell in love. They were married three months later. And we moved to Arizona a month after that because he got stationed in Arizona. And my biological dad's story is a lot less romantic. He'd been dating my stepmom, I think for a year, she was working as a piercer, which she did for most of my upbringing like ears um, and shit yeah like piercing ears and every okay yeah. she pierced someone's ear and accidentally nicked herself and that person then decided to tell her oh i also am hiv positive and so it was like a very big freak out she went to the hospital they like did all like the systems flush whatever i'm not a doctor right and she came home and like we'll find out in six months and they do another test and my dad's response is like we should get married so you can be my health insurance <laughs> <laughs> and they've been together ever since so Are like mom that, and stepdad still together uh mom and stepdad still together and dad and stepmom in some regards are still together it's weird how old it's, are you i'm 28 damn yeah that's bananas yeah it's wild yeah but I, if i'm you know not to be all therapizing if i were to no, go ahead if I were to look at the big picture, like that's a really great, like those two stories really do encompass like all, all that is Samantha is like the practicality of my dad being like, yeah, yeah, yeah we need to try my health insurance. Let's get married. And my mom right. getting married after knowing someone for only three months and being like, yep, that's life, baby. Let's do it. You know, I'm like, okay, it makes sense. I love this. This is fascinating to me. And I also, <laughs> I share some parallels with you. Not, I, I want to get into what they do for work too, because it's always very interesting to me. You mentioned the military thing with stepdad, but hold on yeah. that thought for one second. I've, I, I don't know how much I've really got into this before on this show with myself, but my mom's married four times. She's currently single. My wow. dad was married twice. He's currently single. Mm -hmm. Those line up in that my my mom was my dad's first wife mm -hmm. and my dad was my mom's third husband. Oh, okay. She was married to my dad second longest, like seven years. Yeah. And then she married my stepdad after him, mm -hmm. 22 years. Then they mm -hmm. got divorced. Now Ooh. he's remarried to his oh. third wife. So I'm I... with yeah. you. I'm so curious, which again, we don't have to talk about, but I'm so curious what okay. the relationship is like with your stepdad, because there was a time uh, later on that my mom and stepdad almost got divorced. Yeah. And that was probably the part of it that like freaked me out the most was like, this man raised me. Like he, he's like my stepdad, like he is my dad, as much as my biological dad is like, I'm close with both of them. Right. What is our relationship if not held together by this marriage? Yeah, that is a wonderful question. And I've had to reckon <laughs> with that in the last few years myself, especially, like I said, as he's gotten remarried to a new woman who I've never met. Oh, whoa. Um, oh, oh, yeah, I don't yeah. know this other. He's like, he's married this other woman. And one one time my mom and I were on the phone and she was like, um, I think he's getting remarried. And I was like, you think? And she, and here's the other thing. Here's the other layer mm -hmm. that you'll like, and we got to move on because who's going to care about any of this, but it's fascinating to you and I, so I if really, anyone I else is I sharing really this, they're it. enjoying yeah. it. I'm like, wait, there's um, more of me out there? <laughs> whatever. Um, <laughs> this is what this is. This is what's happening. Um, here's the other fun part. My mom, my stepdad, my dad, until he retired, and my stepmom, who is no longer in my life, but was my dad's second wife, mm -hmm. they all worked in the same business the exact same business doing almost oh. the exact same job and they all moved into different locations constantly and that's like how they met and knew each other to this day my mom and my stepdad who are divorced are still friends and work at the same place Whoa. and he's remarried wow so i guess and that's they see each other every day they talk that's every day they're friends yeah Whoa. They were married for 22 years, I think. 21, 22, something like that. 
I want to ask like, so then what was it? If, it, if they're friends, I'm always curious by that. Like if right. I, I say that being friends with a lot of my, my exes, but I'm always like, Me so too. Ask, like what was it? What was it? What was it? What was the thing? I don't know. You know, I wish I knew. And, and they're not like, and also, you shouldn't book know. and also you shouldn't know as, as a child, as a child of that relationship, there are things that like, even though you're older, even though you're an adult, that right. like, it's none of my business. Should, well, not even that should, isn't your business, but like you shouldn't have to bear the burden of that information because we already bear so much information that shouldn't be ours. Why add on to it? Mm, I like that thought. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So let we, we got to talk about singing. Can yeah. we talk about singing for like a second? Yeah. We're almost yeah. out of time, but if we could talk about singing. Um, so, well, you said your sister also went uh, to school of the arts for wig and makeup. Yeah. So you guys are living where when her going to college starts to be a conversation? Okay, this is a really great setup because this is a story cool. that I need the people to know. Let's I'm go. Sorry. Listen I... up. If you were if you <laughs> fell off the rails because of our mommy daddy issue conversation, <laughs> get your ass back to the screen. Listen up. Samantha, um, you were saying. Uh, we were living in North Carolina. So uh, we lived in Fayetteville, North Carolina, near the military base. Um, Samantha was very type A in many aspects of her life, and one of them being college. I was ready and preparing to go to college when I was in sixth grade. I was researching what schools I wanted to go to. I was trying to figure it out. I mean, I knew that music was something I wanted to do at a really young age because music was the one of the few things that was felt very universal no matter where I was. You know, wherever we moved, there was always some program or some place for me because I could sing. Um, so in sixth grade, I remember my sister was in eighth grade and eighth grade going into like high school, they start kind of like talking about, you know, all right, you're going to high school. This is where your grades really matter. And you start taking classes in eighth grade, depending on how seventh grade goes for you that actually matter in high school. You can start knocking exactly. some high school shit out. Exactly. Algebra. Doing, yeah. Language classes. You start doing that kind of stuff. And so I remember having a conversation with my sister because she was like, I need to figure out where I want to go to college. And I told her, I was like, oh, well, I'm going to UNCSA. I knew that I wanted to go to UNC School of the Arts when I was in sixth grade because I wanted to act. I wanted to sing. And UNC School of the Arts was like the arts program in North Carolina. So at the time I was like, well, this is where I have to go. This is accessible. It's one of the best programs out there. And it's in North Carolina. I told my sister that. And then I think it was like two or three weeks later, my parents and I were like eating dinner. My sister was like late to dinner and she comes in. And my parents like, you know, we really like that school that you sent us, Haley. Like we should go take a tour. And I'm like, oh, what school? And she's like, I want to go to UNCSA. And I was like, what? <laughs> you want to go where? And she's like, yeah, they have a wig and makeup program. And at the time, my sister, she loved, she was doing all types of like special effects makeups and, and you know, her friends would have the like eighth grade social. She did their makeup and hair. Like she was, she was passionate about it for sure, but she had no idea about UNCSA until I told her. And college was this thing that for so long, I was so looking forward to creating like my own identity because growing up, my sister and I, you know, again, we are of the the same situation. Our parents got divorced really young and everyone, like we were the first grandkids and we were grandkids of a very broken family getting shoved into grandparents' faces and aunts and uncles taking care of us. So it was always the girls. It was never how Samantha doing, how's Haley doing. It's how are the girls. What's so the I, exact time distance? We're less than two years apart. We're ah. less than Yes. My yeah. wife is exactly the same with her brother and dealt with that exact same thing. They're like 14, 15 months apart. Right. Despite, I mean, and this is, I mean, if we're getting really into it, I'm, it's so fascinating to me how different my sister and I are not only personality wise, but the way that we approach things, how we cope, how we respond to difficult situations. We were in the same environments. We did almost all the same things until you start getting to middle school, high school. And obviously we experience different things, but we are so different, but up until call it, I mean, up until like high school, we were always just bundled into one unit. Um, right. So, so when she was like, I'm going to UNCSA, like I was, I was fucking pissed. I was can like, I, can we pause before we go forward? Because I love this so much. Yes. I hate this for you, but you're smiling. So I'm not, why am I being sensitive to you? Here's the thing. Here's what <laughs> I want to know. Yeah. When you were young, 
<laughs> what is the I bet I'm and let me let me guess when you were really young you didn't feel that way you were like happy to just be a kid and your sister's also a kid you didn't need that distinction at some point right mm -hmm. you're like but Samantha is her <laughs> own person and I would like to people to start recognizing that right yeah yeah like here, here's my question when that started happening for you what were the qualities that you were like, she's fucking like this. I'm not mm -hmm. like that. I wish mm -hmm. people would recognize it's not just the girls. Samantha is, and then fill in the fucking blank. What was, what felt even at that young age, sixth, seventh, eighth grade, somewhere in there that you're like, I am different yeah. and I want people to know. Yeah. You know, what's really sad about it is like, it's it's less about like who Samantha is and more about like how much she was doing to keep everything together because Ooh. you know what I mean? So like when you I was credit a little bit for the work you yeah, were doing in a, in a way. Yeah. Because again, my sister and I responded very differently to the levels of brokenness. That was our family, you know, meaning we, what meaning my sister was much more rebellious. My sister okay. was much more, and I don't want to speak too much for her, but I think she, she would agree. Well, she qualifies, so we'll have her on later. To I know, yeah. She, part two is what's Haley's perspective on this. But Haley was much more rebellious. She, you know, with all that was going with my family, I my, my mom and stepdad almost got divorced. You know, we stopped being able to see my biological dad because of him. Like, he continued to sell pot up and like for years, but we didn't know it until I was like 12 or 13. And he was growing. Was in he in Washington state? Washington state. Yeah. How long was pot illegal in Washington state until when? It didn't legalize until, until I was like 13, 14. Oh, sure. So like, okay. right. So he, and he was also growing it in his home, like right. in a bedroom right below where we'd Not sleep. small amounts. I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. Big operation. Um, he, so like we stopped being able to see our dad when I was like 12 or 13. That so like, sucks, dude. yeah. So like losing access to, to our biological dad, our stepbrother, our stepmom, my mom and stepdad almost getting divorced. Like there was a lot going on, like emotionally, my sister's response was like, screw you guys. Like sure. I'm just, she, you know, she was out with her friends all the time. She would like sneak out. Her grades like really struggled at some points and it's all a very reasonable response to what was going on in our childhood my response was and my and my parents are upset about it you know I saw the arguments my parents would get in with my sister the like the grounding she would get in the all that stuff my response is well this makes mom and dad upset not doing good in school makes mom and dad upset and you know, Haley's getting all this attention for all the things she's doing that's not okay. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to get great grades. I am going to be involved in extracurriculars. I'm not going to be a bother to the system because the system is falling apart. So by the time, and those, and those, that mentality goes all the way back to when, you know, little Samantha, four or five year old was, was, was operating, was the system's falling apart. You can't add to it. You can't add to the chaos. So by the time I get to high school, when you feel that sense of, I want my identity to be known, I want to be noticed. For me, it was less like, look at me, I'm talented, or like, look at me, I'm I'm funny, or look at me, I'm smart. It was, look at how hard I'm trying to give you what you need so that you have one less thing to worry about. What made you feel like that wasn't there? Like, what weren't you seeing or hearing from whom that would have given you that? Um, yeah, they're on there. And my mom and my stepdad totally acknowledges it's it's interesting. My my younger half brother and I at Christmas had a conversation about this. He my younger brother had no idea my parents were on the verge of divorce. Hmm. He had no idea. My parents did a really great job of sheltering him for that. But I was not sheltered from that in any regard. How old um, were you when that was happening? I was uh like 16, 16. Oh, and fuck, so my, yeah. yeah. So and Haley, my sister, she went off to college. So she wasn't there when it like she was there when it was starting to break down and she knew it wasn't like okay. But I was there when it was like, you know, really bad. Yeah. Um, so it what it didn't look like is it didn't look like my parents had the capacity to ask me what I'm interested in, to show up to the choir concerts 
to come to the rehearsals, to volunteer, to come to, uh, help out build sets for the musicals I was doing. It, it was really about time and attention. And I saw my parents' time, time and attention going towards making sure my younger brother didn't know things weren't okay and going towards Haley we need to get her into college we need to make sure that like she gets better grades and that like she's not out late at night like we need to like get on her and there just wasn't time or energy left for Samantha especially when Samantha was doing great she's got great grades she yeah cool. and it's weird because oh. you you created that for yourself right 100%. like that's that's yeah. the beautiful thing here that I think is a life lesson I think this is worth mentioning across the board. You don't have to be in the diverse, dysfunctional, whatever words you want to put on what I, I'm using words for myself, not you. Oh, totally, you don't yeah. have to be in, in, a, in a mess to experience that exact thing, which is like, if you go out of your way and it is your habit and it is your focus to make sure you're not a problem, don't be surprised when people forget about you. Yeah, Don't be surprised when people think you didn't have a problem because that's what you were that trying to too. do is make yeah. sure no one knows there's a problem. Yeah, totally. Right. Yeah. But when you look back on it, would you do it differently? Would you start to be a problem to get the attention? Because wasn't there enough of that going on already? Um, You know, it's it's a it's a double-edged sword, you know, because I mean, my, I, my mom and I have talked about this extensively, my stepdad and I, through like many phases of my life post-graduating, I've done the the work with my parental units to kind of mesh through what was going on in their end, because mm. um, you only know so much, you know, at the time it didn't look like, I didn't understand. Yeah. My parents don't have the energy and they're humans and they're trying to make like this marriage work and take care of this family. Like I have that perspective now, obviously, because one, I'm, I'm an adult and two, I've had those conversations. Um, I think that, I mean, if anything could have been done differently is like, yeah, I think that I wish that my parents would have stepped up more to make sure that I was okay. Um, but like at the same time, we, when you only have so much, you only have so much. Um, right. And, and I, I don't, not a lot of people are like this and there are many, but part of my, the work that I've done therapy wise is loving the parts of myself that were formed in those moments of trauma, in those moments of like hardship that I consider myself a very extroverted person because I moved around a lot. We were at a different place every three years. If you wanted friends, you had to go out and get them. They weren't going to come to you. I consider myself a very observational person because when you're in a room and you need to make friends, you need to pick out who you're going to talk to, who is the safest, who is like, who can you just like get in there with really quickly? You got to be able to read people. I consider myself someone very funny because I'm observational and none of those things would have manifested in me had I not been put in the situation that I was at the age that I was. It's fascinating to me. I think we have a lot of parallels, uh, totally. you and I, which is uh, unusual, ironically, I think, uh, for a lot of people that I talk to on here, because you know what I find is kind of mm. surprising to me? Mm. Divorced parents don't create as many artists as you'd think. Really? I'm not saying it's not in droves. People listening to this show will be DMing me like, my yeah, parents are divorced, oh, bro, blah, blah, blah. My parents are divorced and I'm so artistic. But I'm telling you, go back and listen to this fucking show. I talk to a lot of people and a lot of these stories aren't that. And if it is, it's a little bit more of a clean break than what you're describing. Yeah. You had a very uh, fractured unit early that spawned all these other things. Yeah. And um, that's a specific experience. Um, I also feel like, and I want to, I just can't let this go because I want to say something about this. <laughs> I don't think a lot of people are comfortable giving themselves the credit that they are a funny person. And you just did that. Oh, totally. Yeah. But that, but that, is, yes, you're right. Not a lot of people want to say they're funny because then like, what's that you know if you think that you're funny you aren't actually or there's something there's something more, better about being someone who's funny and doesn't know it or something i think um, what it is is that if you give yourself a sincere uh amount of credit for 
comedy or any version of humor, mm -hmm. uh, you're immediately not taken seriously for taking the, the not serious seriously. You know what I yes. mean? It's like why there's no comedy awards. Yes. You can't do that because yes. you're effectively saying it matters when the whole point is that's really not supposed to. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, most of my life, I don't think that I would, I would have claimed I'm a funny person. Um, but it's through therapy that like you, like one, you have to find it. Like, what do you actually like about yourself? And like, why do you like it about yourself? And like humor has been one of the, uh, the largest and strongest, uh, communication skills. Oh, hold on. Garbage truck. I don't hear it. Oh, then great. Zoom's but great. Go ahead. Um, Comedy has been one of the largest and strongest communication skills that I developed at a really young age as a quote unquote performer. Um, and I, if I'm the only way to acknowledge the parts myself that I like is to actually acknowledge that is what I'm doing. I mm. have to be able to say like what I am doing when I say I'm being funny is it's being observational. It's like seeing what's in a room, seeing what someone's doing, being a great listener. Like to be funny is not just to be funny. It's a lot of things. And I, I am a lot of those things, but why waste my time, time saying all of them and not just be like, I'm funny. And you know what that means? I'm funny. Right. I see it. I hear it. I'm smart. I, I observe. I am there. I am quick. I am, I'm witty. Like that stuff it's all a part of being funny. And most people are really funny, but just don't have timing, you know? And I'm not saying I have great timing, but a lot of people are funny, just don't have timing. And that's a performer. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, for me personally, it's been a long journey to giving myself that credit. And mm -hmm. I have been a comedian that's gotten yeah. like paid to do comedy. And I've yeah. gotten like, I like won contests. I beat other people who were trying to be funny. That was the only goal of what we were doing. And even yeah. in those moments, I was like, kind of asshole says they're funny. It's like, why am I not allowed? Yeah. yeah. And I totally. think the thing I finally came to, and maybe you appreciate this, I actually kind of heard some of this in what you were saying, but this is just mm -hmm. the way I've described it to myself recently. And I said this to my wife. I was like, when I was a, when I was a young person dealing with the kinds of things that you were describing family wise and all the chaos. Mm -hmm. I was not, I was like a bland, a total blend. It sounds like uh, in a way between you and your sister, because I certainly gave up really early on grades, mm -hmm. but I also, I, I very much didn't want to be a problem. I yeah. very much didn't want to like create because my sister, older sister, but by way more, was yeah. a nightmare that I was like, don't do that. <laughs> Lesson it's, learned. Right. Like, it, like who, who would we have been had we not had an older sibling that made all of the like, quote unquote, mistakes or wrong? I am confident I would be a more of a piece of shit. 100%. Like way more, Same. way more. Because my yeah. parents also gave me a lot of self-esteem, like a lot. Mm -hmm. They were like, you're really smart you're really funny they said that shit to me a lot it was the 90s that was very popular yeah they were rebelling from their parents who never said nice things to them and yeah. they were like you're fucking you're the you might be the best kid like yeah. we've known a lot of kids and you're like the best <laughs> and i'm like what i just started yeah. and they're like i know which is crazy you're like i've done nothing crushing it. yeah it's it's, it's kind of <laughs> fucked up you're scaring us yeah and i was like all right well, i guess i'll just keep it up you're like god this power <laughs> yeah like, it was insane this? And if that yeah. hadn't been checked by watching my sister just yeah, my make, ego's just big enough, slam but... <laughs> into every wall like a video game where you're holding a racing wheel and it just you're hitting everything on the side. That yeah, was my sister. I'm still on the road though. I'm still on the road. <laughs> I was back behind. Like all you gotta do is not hit the shit on the side. A 100 like, how hard is that? Right. But we saw the things getting hit. But yeah. we, if we didn't see them getting hit, we would have done the exact same thing. They're I, in the I, fog. Yeah, they are in the right. fog. They're in front of the line, there's no car in front of them. And we're just like, okay, just don't go to the right because that's hitting there. Just keep going straight. Yes. And in that time and in that chaos, we could have you and I, let's just put mm -hmm. you and I in the same boat and say you and I could have spent a lot of time on a lot of different shit. Yeah. We could have gotten great, you know, at like mm -hmm. magic. Or something that you have to be alone in your room for hours distracting yourself doing the same thing, getting great at it. Or like <laughs> uh, or like even playing an instrument. I mean, you're a musician, but you weren't 
you weren't like at the keys or or something mm-hmm. like that where you could just be totally alone over and over again singing you gotta at some point you gotta have fucking somebody listen to you yeah but you're not here unless someone's hearing you <laughs> but point being you establish uh an escapism at that age and in that situation yeah that to this day bringing it back to the whole point that we brought up when i was saying to my wife about being funny it feels fucked up not to give myself credit for how hard I worked at a thing. Like yeah. if it had been something else and in that time I had gotten great at magic, to this day I wouldn't hesitate to be like, I'm a fucking great magician. Do you know why? Because totally. I was sad. <laughs> like <laughs> yeah. I would explain it and I can do the same thing with being no funny. Attention to me. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I can do that with comedy and be like, no, I am like objectively hilarious. Like I am a very funny person. And you right. know what? It's because... I had to be, and you it's not to. like I'd necessarily go back and pick it again. It was my way of dealing yeah. with shit. And to yeah. this day, I've decided, okay, I'm going to try to make money off of it since I learned. Yeah. I spent all my time as a kid trying to make people laugh and get people to sleep with me. And if I'm yeah. not going to pursue those things in my adult life, then what the fuck? Yeah. I didn't do the grades. <laughs> But the so grades not gonna be that. The grades really don't matter. So I think you that's a solid choice. Solid Yeah, choice. but the skills you get from doing yeah. the grades can pay off. I'm believe me, I'm big grades don't matter. I'm huge on that. But <laughs> I think but I think the diligence that you build from going through something like that or whatever you're focused on at the time, which I gotta get back. We only have so much time because I do have another one in a bit, but I, I want to get back to something because I feel like we're only barely covered <laughs> act one here. Um you said you were doing musicals. You said yeah. something about your parents not coming to do sets and stuff like that. Also, what the fuck, right? I like semi-supportive parents. Why aren't you helping with this? Anyway. Um, <laughs> oh, it's all this chaos. Whatever. Mm-hmm. I don't care. Um, three hours. Three hours on a Saturday. <laughs> come on. Everybody come on. else was there. What are you doing? Recovering yeah. from your 70-hour work week? Like, I got time. Yeah, raising three to the beating all of us. Fuck excuse all. machines is what they were, <laughs> parents. <laughs> Yeah. Gross. So musicals are the in. I told you, I think before, I don't remember if we were recording or not, but my wife was a voice major at a conservatory. Her background was very choral. Like yeah. she did not do musicals. She was like all in choirs, Christian yes. church choirs and all this kind of stuff like that. But you were like a musical kid. Were you like an MT kid? Why not go to MT school? Why do like vocal opera shit? Did you do opera in high school? No, well, I was both. I was with a, a choir kid and I was a, a musicals kid. Like any opportunity. A lot of them are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, most in terms of part of why I like music being super transitional between places, that was choir. That was you yeah. shoot out of class and you meet people, you sing the songs. Um, but musicals were my opportunity to act because that was, it wasn't just singing that I like. In fact, when I wanted to go to UNC, UNCSA originally, it was because I wanted to act. Like I wanted to go to the drama school. Right. That was, you know, my initial intent. And, you know, in the same way that you were like, you know, I, I've done stand up, I've done all these things to prove that I'm funny. When I was in high school, I do you know, do you, do you know what, um, forensics is? Do you know what that is? In what context? It doesn't leap out to me. I know okay, the word. You don't know what it is because you need the context. <laughs> Yeah. Forensics in North Carolina slash like I think just in the South in general was essentially speech and debate. They had several. Mm. Yeah, several different. Yeah, No, we didn't have that when I was. I mean, we had speech and debate. We didn't call it that. Right. So we have forensics and it, it, it spanned like several different categories you had. And most of it was like, you know, acting. So you had um, uh, I think it was dramatic interpretation, which is just someone uh, performs a monologue. They do several rounds. Yeah. And, you know, you get scored and there's, you can do it at the county level, state level. There's like the regional level. Um, we I, have I, that. It's called uh, UIL. Okay. Well, then it's probably the same then. Yeah. yeah. It was called forensics for some reason, for some reason in North Carolina. I did that. I did dramatic interpretation. I placed second in the county. And I also did they a very, it's a category they didn't have very often, but impromptu duo, which is. Yeah. I know what that is. Yeah. Yes. I I placed second in the state. I and for improv. What the fuck was... are you going to school for? Fucking singing. Like all due respect. Oh like, no, no, but you're, you're like you're... funny and you can act and you're smart and like why are you going oh. in just one of these things? Okay, well, there's two parts of that. Number one, um, in my experience, the drama school at UNCSA does not bring in fat people. They do not. <sighs> 
They don't, they don't bring fat people in. And when they do, it's like a really big deal. And we're like, wow. Yeah, it's it's eating- rare. They do, they do have a type over there. Right. So like I was already at a disadvantage and I knew that. And number two, by the time that I got to my senior year, I was so ingrained in the don't cause problems, do what you need to do, survive on your own because no one's looking out for you. That by the time, despite doing, I mean, I mean, there's more p- parts to it. We moved back to Washington and we. Mo- I went to a school. I graduated from a high school that did not have a drama program, did not have improv. All they had was a choir program run by this wonderful la- lady, Miss Backus, um, who'd been there for decades, um, but they had no programs for me. And so by then I was like, okay, we're just not going to do music. Like we, w- w- that's like, that's over for us. I was going to go to school for like either political science or history. And the only reason that I went to you and say at that point is because I'd saved up money from working 30 hours a week at my job at Little Caesars to go visit my sister at UNCSA. And she was like, you have to come here. You have to audition when you're here. And when I went there, they didn't have any drama auditions left. They only had music auditions. So I was like, this is the only time I could come here during my spring break. So I might as well audition for music. And then I did. I auditioned. I got waitlisted. And it was just like this really this ping moment of, okay, all the other schools I applied to, I got into for history. They don't have good music programs. If there's ever a moment to be like, you love this thing, you should do it. This is it. And so, and my audition was awful. I auditioned, I had brought like a jazz piece because I thought it fit all of the requirements. No, you're not allowed to audition with a jazz piece. You have to audition with like these specific classical pieces. I had to learn a song from some book within 30 minutes before my audition because I had to have three songs to offer and sing two of them. Luckily, I didn't have to sing it, but it was just, it was awful. So the fact that I got waitlisted, just like blessed by the stars, um, anyway, so when I got wasted, I decided to send a letter to all the music faculty. And I was like, Hey, you made a mistake. You meant to accept me. And this is why here's what I did wrong in my audition. Those things don't happen again. I learned from my mistakes. Like you, you like, this is, I know what I'm doing and you will not regret this. And, um, one of the studio teachers, Miss Pretnicki responded and she was like, you know, I don't have any space left in my studio. But if you want, I've convinced um, Mr. Siebert, one of the other studio teachers, if he will take you on, um, and then next year you can transfer to my studio. And I was like, done, I'll take it. And and so I was like, it was one of the first moments in a long time that I was like, I'm going to do this thing that's like really risky and like get a degree in music that could lead to fucking nothing and is really unsafe and not smart and not a survival mood like move and see if it takes me anywhere and I'm not going to take it for granted. So, yeah. <laughs> How'd that work out? <laughs> um, Wonderfully, wonderfully in that, like, uh, it was not what I expected the UNCSA. It's not like what I went, what I, when I went into it, I was expecting something completely different. I thought that there'd be what a way were you expecting. I was expecting that there'd be a way that I could maybe get into the drama program that I could act in all types of different things that um and that I would be like a big star by by like the end of it and that is 100% not what happened and thank god in many regards so what's the biggest thing that you're glad didn't happen on that list um I'm glad that I didn't transfer to uh, Miss Protnicki's studio that did mm. not happen. I stayed with Mr. Siebert all four years and him and I like and I was so lucky that he was my studio teacher because he, I mean, the studio teachers for uh, vocal performance at UNCSA are really good and they're really tough. And some of them are really judgmental and some of them don't really see the big picture of performance and art outside of opera. And Mr. Siebert's not like that. Mr. Siebert mm. is very open and excited about experimenting and and just like moving opera in a different direction outside of what it has been as if it's all that it can be. And I needed that because I 
And I didn't learn this until, again, kind of like your wife, which I think we talked about before we started recording. Like I realized halfway through my time at UNCSA that I did not want to be an opera singer. I did not want to put the time and effort into the degrees that it would take to be successful in opera, but I loved learning and I loved my classes and I loved the opportunities that came to me and that I, I, I clawed at for because I, I expected so many more and different kinds of opportunities but there were lots of opportunities, not because UNCSA provided them, but because of who I am. What does that mean? Um, I don't know if you've talked to like other vocal students at UNCSA or other like music students, but most sure, music students some. do not leave the practice room. They do not leave the music room. Very rarely do you meet a lot of them because they are practicing, which is what you should be doing if you want a career in music is you should be in that practice room. You should be t doing your aural skills. You should be doing all that stuff. And I did that stuff and I was good, but I was also like a part of the improv troupe for like four years. I was also headed up stand-up night and like student activities. I was a part of student government. I was a part of Welcome Squad. I was helping produce short films. I was singing. You were I there was... to go to college also. Right, right. And real college sort of. Like I was there for like to meet people and to learn and um and to try and to try. And and that's what I came out of UNCSA was that I realized that. Like, I like a lot of things. I like doing a lot of things. Um, but I don't like one thing enough to do it only for the rest of my life. Um, and to do opera, that it has to be what you love and want to do for the rest of your life. I feel like, well, first of all, I mean, I have to know then what was the rest of 2017 like for you? if you spend half of it finishing a program that's designed to send you off to a job that you don't want? Um, well, again, because I had such a great studio mentor, um, I he changed things for me. So mm. at UNCSA, we have intensive arts. Usually for music students, what that means is like you're going to a lot of seminars. Um, if you're a musician, you're probably in rehearsals for Nutcracker or performances. Um, I, I think it was like my, by my third year, um, I didn't have to do that. I actually taught some courses for intensive arts. I taught improv and, and most music, uh, vocal students were required to take my course teaching improv. Um, and then for my fourth year, um, I decided to produce a, a a short film slash an opera. So I brought some students together. We put a, like, we put a libretto together. We put music to it. We recorded it. Like we made a short film and that was my intensive arts project. And I, you know, cast a bunch of uh, obviously like my classmates and that was what we did instead. So like the, the program changed for me because of what I wanted to do. I, I assistant directed um, the spring or the, the winter and the spring operas, instead of performing in them, I did not have to perform um, because I was assistant directing. So, so it was it was great for me. Like I, I had a I had a studio mentor who was willing to be like, you were learning things and you were changing things, and and that and that counts towards the program. And I think that's where, if there's any resentment towards UNCSA, is that like. I saw the program change for people. It changed for me. I saw it change for other people, but it wasn't changing often enough. And I didn't see it like, like that's like the magic of UNCSA is that like a lot of things are possible and a lot of opportunities exist, but they weren't doing it enough for people. And their excuse is that like, we can't do it. And I'm like, yeah, you can. I've seen you do it. You did it for me and you did it for those two people. Why just them? Why just me? Well, it's kind of inherent in the conservatory yes. ideals to keep things the same for the sake of we've worked on the best ways to educate on these skill sets over a really long period of time. And we have an idea of the basic skills that everybody needs. Like it's an old education. That's kind of what you're buying. So how to compromise that with being progressive at the same time. It's kind of yeah. like the Vatican being progressive, you know? It's almost uh, 
uh, paradoxical. It's an, it's oxymoronic. It's like, what do you mean? What do you mean? Change it more often? Yeah. Are you here? Like, do you hear? You're talking about a conservatory, and your your air advises to change it more often. Samantha, you're insane. <laughs> yeah, but it works. But it yeah. works. It works when you. I mean, again, I'm not saying that for every single student who comes to you and is like, hey, I don't want to go to this class. Be like, great, because you're probably a genius and you shouldn't go to this class. Like, no, a big part of like who I was is because of the structure, at least the two years. The first two years, it was like very structured and very hard. And it it only got harder for me specifically because of how much more I wanted to do than what the program provided me. But I, I did it. I mean, I worked three jobs my last two years of college, too, on top of the already extensive program because I, I, I had to pay tuition. Like, my family could not afford to have both me and my sister go to UNCSA. She had in-state because when she went, we lived in North Carolina. When I went to Washington, I immediately had out-of-state tuition the entire time. And despite, yeah, and despite the fact, which this is also maybe a grievance of mine, despite the fact that I worked for student affairs, not only in Welcome Squad, but also Front Desk, I was like, I knew student affairs, student government, like they knew my face. I was taken out of classes sometimes to go to fundraising events. So I was opted out to talk to investors and to talk to people who are donating to be like, look at this model student. This is what you're donating for. And I was never like, I applied for in-state just several times was never granted it signed by the same people that I saw every day in that office. Like there was no, like, yeah, it was that there you go. If there's anything that like still makes me a little upset is like, I invested so much into that school. I brought so many students to different departments. Like I was so involved and yet there wasn't any, yeah, there wasn't any assistance for me financially, you know? Yeah, I would agree with that. I would say that's one of my biggest critiques as well. Um, their financial aid office, when Jane Camia was there, I don't know who does it now. Uh, maybe she's still there, maybe somebody else. But their financial aid office is really, really good. Uh, that That's one of the things that I will give them some props for. Uh, the people at the time were whizzes at finding like grants and things that didn't have to be paid back and things like that. My biggest yeah. gripe is always... Um, and I, this needs to be fixed on the FAFSA level for the federal uh, financial aid assessment. It needs to be fixed uh, at the state level, at the UNC system level, and it needs to be fixed locally at School of the Arts, which is there are two kinds of students attending post-high school secondary education, mm -hmm. two, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. There are students who are worried about how much it costs them. And there are students who are not. The students who are worried about how much it costs them, I am not talking about the middle, upper middle class family that's like, ah, I wish it weren't so much. That's not what the fuck I'm saying. I'm talking about the people who are concerned about making their next semester at this place where your fucking credits don't transfer in or out. Yep. They're worried about getting that next semester accomplished, being yep. able to attend school. Mm -hmm. um, versus the people who are like one way or another, they're going to be in the fucking class because they're going to yep. get it figured out. Mm -hmm. There is not enough focus put on making sure that those kids who qualify for this incredibly limited prestigious education that you tell so many other kids, they don't have a right to attend because they weren't good enough because mm -hmm. that's how the school, the school works. Mm -hmm. You got these kids who were good enough to get in but they're not good enough for you to help them out financially. And the whole goddamn system should be restructured around people who have pushed themselves so far that they've gotten good enough to get into the program, but they have no way of doing it other than to work three jobs. I worked at the IHOP on Silas Creek for three years while I was going to school. Yeah. It, and not until I turned 24 could I convince the federal government that both of my parents' incomes were irrelevant to yep. how much money I had to go to school. Yep. They don't care what your relationship is to the people who are supposed to provide your educational background. Yep. And when you have someone who at like 18, 19, 20 is like out on their own, working their own job, paying their own bills, 
no fucking help. Maybe they're like on their like Obamacare mom's insurance or they have some break like that. Maybe, maybe when I was in school, it wasn't even fucking thing at first. Mm -hmm. Then you can't recognize that they're hustling so hard that, okay, well, let's fund this kid's education. Like, holy shit. They've shown us they're going to use it. They're dedicated. These other kids might quit. Because yeah. they, as far as they're concerned, they're like, well, mom's dad paying for it. If all of a sudden, I don't know, Asheville sounds like more fun or I don't know, I'll go to New York. Maybe that's a thing. Mm-hmm. When everybody's, when you have someone who's all their chips are fucking stacked on yeah. this and they're, and they're showing you that and it's not that many chips to begin with, mm-hmm. man. No, I mean, I, I, yeah, I totally agree. I mean, I, because I mean, again, UNCSA is not for everyone. It, nope. it, it had to be for me because like you said, tran- like credits don't transfer. I, after my first year, I think I applied to Columbia at Chicago because I wanted to be a comedy writer and I got in and I was like, I wanted to go. And I was like, but I fucking can't, I can't afford it. I can't afford to have lost one year of school and like just that one extra year of like finances. I can't afford it. I have to commit to this. So in terms of like how much I did at UNCSA, it was because like, this is the, this is the, my only opportunity. Like there isn't going to some other school. And all they had to do for me was give me in-state tuition. Cause I had already lived off campus for two years. I'd been paying rent for two years. I worked at that. Like I worked, I, it was all based off me. And the only reason they said they wouldn't give it to me is because I took an internship in Seattle and it, the internship was one month. And it was like, well, that's where your parents, parents live. It was like, because I couldn't afford to take an internship anywhere else if I didn't have housing somewhere. And that's where I've had them. like, but you, you went back to Washington. When you you said, went and made like, money in another state, you traitor. Flash, you went and took the education that we gave you and found and applied an it and applied what we gave you to an internship to then get job placed in the future. And then we will, we will monetize. Look at this student who got internships and, and had a job right before she graduated. It's because of this great education. It's like, no, it's because I had to hustle in spite of this, this system. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to lie. I'm pretty frustrated with the fact that I have to cut this short. <laughs> That's I do. Okay. <laughs> no, I have to do it. I have one last question for you and I, I can only give you like a couple minutes to answer it. Great. Um, you said you're in Los Angeles. When we first yeah. started talking. Yeah. Uh, what part of town are you in? Uh, Echo That's Park. not my question. Okay. <laughs> I'm like, what a choice. Echo Park. <laughs> Echo Park. Okay, cool. I used to live in yeah. Silver Lake. Um, so what are you doing now? What are you up to? Um, and that's not a pressure question. It's <laughs> just generic yeah. because yeah. we've, we've established over the last hour that you're not singing opera out here. So what is, what is taking up your time? Uh, I work in post-production in TV. I work in post-production <laughs> and, uh, and I, I model sometimes, um, and I'm like working my way into like producing. So that's what the... do you do in post-production? I'm a post coordinator, post supervisor. And I, I work on the TV side, but I'm like moving my way into, um, into, uh, new media for the sake of just like, I don't want to have to be in LA if I don't want to, because TV. Can can you tell me what TV shows you work in post-production on? Are you allowed to? Oh yeah. My most recent show that I worked on was Fargo. Fargo season Mm. five was my most recent show. And then pretty well received piece of media. Yeah. Yeah. People like it. People tend to like it. It was an interesting show. It was interesting. Um, yeah, that's most recent. But I mean, again, minutes left. This strike has really affected <laughs> the the work. So you know what blew people's minds? Mm-hmm. They actually quit writing. <laughs> that's what. But I've talked to so many people, and everyone who obviously, like most of my friends that had anything to do with the strike, were in the WGA or SAG. Yep. So like. That's the perspective that I've heard. But when I talk to other people, like crew people, stuff like that, everybody's like, you know, they really stopped writing. Like when they came back, they didn't have anything. And I was like, yeah, yeah, (laughs) that was the point. They weren't taking time off to work for free. What the fuck do you think it was about? Totally. Yeah. Yeah. So funny to me. Yep. Oh my goodness. Well, um. Yeah, I'd love to have you back. We should talk again. Yeah, I'd love that. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, do you have any parting words or thoughts until we see you again? 
based no. just like, ruminating <laughs> on what we've talked about I mean, most of what we talked about is like childhood trauma and how it got me to UNCSA, which I, I I hope that people can relate to the experience of when you only have one shot, you you get what you can out of it. But there's just so many other layers to it that I hope that the takeaway isn't that that's the only way to do it or like I'm I was some different special creature of motivation because don't worry, like I was sad and I struggled and there were some really shitty things that happened and I lost a lot of friendships and I gained a lot of friends and I would do a lot of things differently, but that's just what it turned into. And it's how I've survived. Words of wisdom. Yeah. Honestly, <laughs> uh, this was wonderful. I can't wait to have you back. Thank you for taking the time to chat with me and yeah. uh, we'll see you soon. Sounds great. <laughs>